So I don't know if you guys can hear it on my side, but it's like pouring outside. So. Oh yeah, yeah it was thunderstorming where I am earlier in the day. We thought there was rain, but we didn't get any. So I'm actually pretty good. Lucky, I came out from the library today and I got all my books wet. So. Your library is open. Yeah, I know, right? It's crazy. Um, I'm in one of the few counties that like is easing into. I don't even know what you call it, remission. Um, but some of the other ones, like, everything's still closed. Am I the only one who's, like, super annoyed that, like, schools aren't really asking students what they want to do, but they're only asking our parents, like, decide for your child what they do for the next eight months of their life, if they want to go in line or in person, and it's, like, incredible, ridiculous to me. I think, it yeah, I think it should be a, some kind of joint decision. Yes, your parents, Yeah, your parents might be responsible for carrying you or transporting you from home to school, but it's also, like, your your school life so it should most importantly be you i understand why they're doing that though because it's like the parents are the taxpayers the parents are the ones who like kind of control whether or not the kids go to school like let's say they do open the school right like that's what the kids want the parent has every right to be like i'm not gonna let my kid go and it's like what was the point so i think they should send the email out to the kids too because like i didn't know that my school was offering options i mean we can't like go to school every day and they tell us that we're important to them that they care about our opinions and then don't ask for our opinion on something that directly impacts us but i do get your point on how you know obviously a lot of them are the one driving but also a lot of parents just like don't get it to be honest i know yeah, right? and I, was, I was very surprised that they didn't send out any sort of survey on what we actually thought of remote learning once we finished the school year because i know so many people who had absolutely awful experiences and so many things that could be improved if we're going to try it again instead of just sending a survey to the parents saying what do you want to do uh yeah yeah, you ba- you basically just covered all of it. Though all almost all of my teachers had end of the year surveys for our respective classes. Yeah, I I had that experience too, but I like I didn't fill out anything. Like I I didn't think I had anything important to say. Oh, I just trashed the whole thing. I said this was the worst experience of my life. <laughs> no, I, I had a better experience than some of my other friends. Um, like in my county, if you basically our past failed work, where if you got a D or higher you could, your grade for the fourth quarter would just be a grade above what you got in the third quarter. And if you got a fail, it would just stay the same as your third quarter grade. So if you had straight A's, like I did, you basically didn't need to show up to class, which is what I didn't do for most of my classes. Yeah, they buffed ours by a third of a letter. So like a mini letter, um, if you passed both of the third term in the uh, third quarter and fourth quarter. So that was actually kind of nice. You got a boost. But everyone in your school is getting a boost. And if you're thinking about like GPA and you're getting compared in comparison to like your other, the other peers in your school. But what I find kind of interesting is that how quickly people's mindset shifted. Like when this thing started, everybody was like, oh my God, I don't have to go to school. That's amazing. But nowadays we're all like, we want to go to school and we don't want to keep going to I don't want to go to school. Yeah. <laughs> Well, sure I mean, yeah, I, I, I kind of don't want to go to school. I'm happy that there's no stress and no test and everything. It was really nice to not have tests. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I, I was very upset because I knew that we weren't going to go back. As soon as they said we were, we we're not going to come back until two weeks. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering because I was trying to go on those lines of like feeling isolated and I was trying to want, I was trying to ask like, how do you guys feel like this might have distressed you or how do you feel like being isolated from the rest of the world has kind of altered your the way that you see things i don't know like my dad uh he he got fired um earlier so he's going to start his own company and so like but if he but because of the coronavirus if he leaves now to like come back home he can't go back so like that's kind of like isolation and my mom is like mad at my dad because he doesn't communicate very much to the rest of the family and i don't talk to my parents very often anyway so it's like i basically talk to no one except for you guys like we're talking now but wait so he has to leave outside of the country well yeah um because uh the the person he wants to do he wants to start the business with and the funding that he wants to get is in a different country and so you know because he's taking a, a business trip probably and he can't come back here and go he, if, if he comes out of that country then he can't go back oh dang wow yeah. I don't really mind it, but honestly. Yeah, quarantine's been pretty rough. I've had to depend on, like, my small group of friends a lot. And it's almost broken our friendship multiple times. But I think it's made us stronger because we're still all talking to each other, so. 
Yeah, I make it. I try to like check in with my friends at least once a day so we can talk and like keep contact because this is how it's gonna be in college. Half friends, bro. Stop flexing. Bro, bro, moment. Yeah, but like it's. I think it's. I think it's gonna be something like that in college, right? Because you and your friends are gonna be separated and you're not gonna talk to each other in in real life. You're not gonna have like a reason to talk to each other. So you need to keep contact every single day and you have to make like effort. Oh yeah. So a lot of what people seem to be experiencing now is this symptom of psychoterratic syndrome, and it isn't really hard. Like, it isn't a hard set definition in most medical practices, but it's something that people have been theorizing recently. And it discusses how, like, you might receive trauma from having too much distance from, like, nature and just the outside world in general. And I kind of do feel that people have been having a lot of difficulty just staying sane within their home environment. And because they do feel a lot of just isolation from everyone in and of themselves, it kind of does make you feel a lot more lonely. Like, even if you're around a lot of people in your house, like me, I have a whole ton of people in my house. You just get sick of them after a while, right? And so... (laughs) Yeah, I think personally, um, the only person that I talk to in real life, I guess, I I don't really talk to the people in my family in my daily life. So it's the only person I interact with is essentially myself. And it's really hard to question your existence or like the reality of who you are and that you actually exist when you're the only person that in your life. Yeah, it can be pretty difficult if you don't have like an outside support system other than the people that live in your house. Um, I do talk to my family a lot, but again, it gets very, very annoying to be with the same group of people 24 hours a day. And, you know, I, I found myself at the beginning of quarantine kind of like going insane and I would be looking forward to going to work because it would be the only time I would see people that I wasn't related to and that I hadn't seen before. But even then, it's like, you know, you don't want your place of sanctuary to be labor. I mean, I think there's a difference between labor and doing stuff that you really enjoy. Yeah, that's true. If it doesn't make you happy, you're not going to be incentivized to do more of it. I think before quarantine, a pasta that my friends would, um, that my friends and I would have, which we would just eat hot Cheetos. So that is like a specific sensory memory that I associate with my friends. So I I buy them and then I... I slowly consume them if I want to invoke the feeling of like sitting with my friends even though I'm not sitting with anyone at all. Oh my gosh, slowly consume them. <laughs> I do. I have to I have to ration them because I feel really guilty asking my parents for stuff or like buying stuff. So yeah, I have to like ration them. I feel yeah. that with like a lot of things too, like especially with music. With me, I really like using music to kind of remind myself of like other places I might have listened to that song in and I kind of do feel all of that sensory stuff just listening to it. Yeah, I feel like background kind of isolation, kind of like what Bloomy was talking about, how like her work was kind of like her space. Personally for me, like I'm not allowed to go out at all. Like not even like take a walk or like a jog. So there like the past three months I've went out maybe like only four times. Like not even like outside my house, like the freaking parking lot. Like, it's been super isolating, and I definitely feel, like, the mental toll. So, like, when we had this episode, I was like, um, yeah, I have to talk. So, I definitely, that's kind of why I was talking earlier about, like, you know, the school stuff and letting parents choose. It's, like, it's just um really bad for me personally. Now, Faith, I got to ask you, because I've been seeing on the news that in southern states, there's been more spikes of coronavirus. So, in Texas, like, is it worse than it was in, like, March, um, April? Or is there only, like, a slight increase? Because I don't, I don't know. Um, like, media says It's anything. way worse. Really? Are you in Texas, too? Yeah. I'm in Dallas. And I guess, like, personally, just because I haven't been out much, I really don't know the difference. Or, like, I can't tell if it's really been that worse. But apparently our state has, like, the second, you know, largest spike or whatever. So apparently it is getting kind of that bad, I guess. But, yeah, um, I live in Harris County, Texas, which is the hardest hit county. Um, My mom works in a hospital and it's been, it's been pretty bad. Oh my god, I didn't realize that. So you you guys aren't even, what do you call, like on the pathway back to, I guess, normalcy? Because like in Maryland, like I said, like in my county, we're on the pathway where like you can go to the library, you can go to restaurants if it's at 50% capacity, but in some different counties, it's like you're still basically on lockdown. So is that Is it more like the latter, I would assume? Um, Actually, so what's happening is that the cases are getting worse and the cases, like the infections are spreading, but at the same time, stuff is opening up 
and people oh, wow. are hanging out again and like everywhere is pretty much open. So if you were to like walk outside or walk to the mall or something, you wouldn't think anything was different. But then when you go to the hospital, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. And it's weird like hearing all of that because in my country, we're, I'd say we're pretty yeah, we're just really scared of the situation and the vast majority of people do follow all the quarantine protocol. But at the same time, they they have rumors that we're not pro- we're probably not going to reach that state of normalcy until like next year, definitely, and that schools probably still won't remain open until like 2021. So it's pretty pretty weird. Wait, so they are already starting to announce like school procedures for the fall semester in the Philippines? Yeah. Right now we're set to start online for like everybody in August, twenty the twenty fourth of August, but even that's like they're saying that might be pushed back. Okay, that's okay. That's crazy because honestly it seems like in the US there's not really consensus on how to handle the coronavirus when it comes to school. Like you have Harvard saying that they're only gonna allow like forty percent capacity at the school. And then you have Princeton saying 50%, but then you have schools like Cornell saying that you have to come in for in-person classes. And some schools are just saying completely online. So I'm like, what is the right course of action if so many different schools are doing so many different things? And once again, I don't like that they're not, like everybody's been saying, I don't like that they're leaving students out of these conversations for the most part, because this is their mental health and it is their, like, their concern, because they're the ones who have to worry about, like, taking all the standardized tests, they're the ones that have to worry about just a lot of these things that are just so out of their control, and they're still not being given a whole ton of control even then. Absolutely. Like from a mental perspective, it was incredibly difficult for so many people around me, and luckily remote learning only lasted about like two months and then it was summer break and people could at least feel like they could breathe but I'm just very worried that people in terms of reopening schools aren't paying enough attention to what effect that could have of long-term remote learning over an entire semester or two. Yeah I know Princeton is only doing like a 10% discount when it comes to tuition and room and board but I think it should be like way more because college and they're just about the call like the classes you're getting it's about the experience about going to campus being one-on-one with the teachers so charging them seventy thousand still or i guess maybe six, even sixty thousand is still ridiculous no matter what the brand name is yo my friend um, my oh sorry who should be free holy sh- wait is someone okay wait never mind okay yeah, but my friend Heike told me that Princeton was going to, Princeton sent out, sent out like a threatening email to all their students being like, don't fucking take a gap year. How dare you? Don't take a gap year. You have to come to Princeton next year. So, right? Going back to like, what, like that, you brought up a really good point about tuition. And I feel like a lot of this does relate to mental health in a way, because if anything, like the way I see it, I think that if people do have to pay full tuition, they might as well also like throw in some counseling services in there because this is a really, really new frontier and people aren't going to know how to deal with it. So they might as well just like equip students before throwing them at the deep end. Yeah. yeah and a lot of students might not have access to in-person counseling services that would have otherwise been available in person at the school that they were going to go to. Yeah, not to mention that I saw this one YouTuber, her name is Katie Tracy, I believe, and she goes to Cornell, but she's from the Philippines, and she was literally having a mental breakdown, that's what the video was called, like, I'm having a mental breakdown, because Cornell was saying that you basically have to come in for in-person classes, but she was like, it takes 24 hours for me to travel from here to the Philippines, it costs a lot of money just to quote a Cornell, and it makes absolutely no sense for you to kind of guilt your students into paying all this money when you know, especially that it's in New York, that coronavirus cases might spike up again in the fall and that you're just going to send all your students back to where they came from anyway. And that's not even anything compared to the fact that ICE just announced that unless your school has in-person classes, if you're an international student, you better transfer to another university or risk being deported because they're not giving out student visas. So this entire situation is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I don't think it's fair that they should charge full tuition for not the same treatment this year. The fact that the ICE is just like requiring international students to stay in person in and of itself, it's like either risk your life or get out of our country. Yeah, I'm hoping Congress will do something about that because ICE isn't, you know, the be all end all. Like, 
this is i mean this kind of sounds i don't want to say unconstitutional but this just sounds like some violation of not only human decency but of, of your rights because they're basically saying that you cannot get an education without risking your life and that's completely absurd it's very angering that n- not a lot of politicians are speaking out about this. I was going to say, like, apart from just mental health, have you guys seen, like, maybe, like, changes in, like, mindsets, personalities, like, due to the isolation and just, like, different environments because of this time? I've become a creative workaholic, so I've just been giving myself work to do. I think I'm the person that, like, I, I don't, I think a lot of people feel very disconnected from reality, and I do, too, but I'm not. I'm 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 okay with this situation personally. Like I'm I'm the kind of person who can just sit there and be okay with it. So I'm finding myself like I'm I'm making ho- hobbies for myself and I'm taking a lot of personal time to establish routines and like do self care. So I think I I like this personal time. Yeah, for sure. I really like how everything kind of feels like a blank slate and we kind of do have a chance to just reassess everything that we've been doing. And so by the time things do return to normalcy, it's just well, this is what I figured out about myself. Here's what I might just do moving forward. I mean, there's obviously like a downside. The fact that you don't go to school or interact with people that are variables means that every day will feel the same and then you won't. Every day just blends into the next day and then you won't have a sense of normalcy or continuity, I guess. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like a lot of people have kind of like felt like they don't really have a certain like identity or like a place to be honest because they're just doing the same thing every day and not really having a chance to explore what's outside of their house. Um, personally, I'm just really happy that less people are looking at me or, like, viewing me, I think. I, I don't know. It's a really, really weird thing to say, I guess. But I think the fact that I'm limiting contact with people um, benefits me in some kind of form. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it sounds like uh, at least a couple of you have benefited from quarantine. But I would say that uh, the cons have outweighed the pros, for me at least. Like, I've had family and friends been affected by covid i've lost family members to covid and it's been i mean i always knew that there's going to be an event that happened in the, our generation's lives that would define it like you know you have the generation that lived through 9-11 you have the generation that lived through jfk's assassination so i knew that we were going to have something that kind of defined the type of people that we would grow up to be and uh, i think this is it and just the type of person that I was in March is very different from the type of person I am now. And I don't know that it's for the better. Maybe it'll make me more resilient the older I get, but it's just been a very sad time. Oh, I'm sorry that happened to you, bro. Um, a lot of my family is out of the country, so they're being taken care of by their government, probably better than we are now. So um, I definitely hope this is a defining moment and that nothing worse happens. A lot of people in the United States think about coronavirus as a fad, and they're just thinking, oh, you know, it's over now. So they're just going outside and spiking it up again. I would say that's yeah, a pretty broad generalization. I, like, there are a lot of people, even if the media doesn't show it, there are a lot of people who take it seriously. Uh, like, yeah, that's like putting a pedestal on the Karens that come to grocery stores and place without masks and saying that's how all Americans are, when almost everyone else is abiding by social distancing rules. Yeah, it's probably just like a, you know, vocal minority. It's just interesting seeing how like everything's become a breeding ground for fear because I know that there's this and there's everything else that's happening and also rumors of like the bubonic plague. Also rumors of like the bubonic plague um, coming out of China and that's just, yeah, it's just a a whole lot to deal with. Okay, that's not going to happen. That's not going to spread. Please don't jinx my word. Can we just go over the fact that the bubonic plague has been in existence? Like, it's not- But I think it was really interesting how you mentioned the coronavirus as like our generation-defining event, because it seems like for other generation-defining events, like 9-11 and the JFK assassination, those were all things that affected everyone kind of in the same way, and everyone at the same time was feeling the same way, but it seems like with corona, everyone's experiencing it so differently. But for some people, like we've said, it's been- devastating whereas for other people they're starting their passion projects so I just thought that was interesting yeah but besides the fact that we're dealing with a pandemic I would say that what's really I guess annoyed me about this time is the fact that 
uh, I would say media companies, just people in my life personally, treat problems that have always existed as if they are brand new. Obviously, I mean, you can guess I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. It, there's so many people in my life, almost all white, that act as if this is something that happened this year. And I'm like, this has always existed. I don't know why it took so long for so many people to care about it, but it has always existed. And I'm happy that it's getting a bigger platform, but I'm also kind of hurt that it's been blatantly ignored when it's been the same intensity, if not the same type of horrifying event in the past. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I think quarantine does contribute to the intensity of Black Lives Matter because the fact that people are at home and they have time to focus on that kind of stuff now. So I guess I kind of have one question. So like, do you guys think like kind of all this isolation it is also made certain things like your home, your family, just like things that are helping you every day to just like get by feel more important to you? Um, I would say just from like a personal standpoint, it's helped. Well, I wouldn't say it helps because my family has always been pretty close, but um, it's definitely helped me become closer with my siblings because my brother recently moved out of the house because he's, you know, an adult. Um, but it kind of tested how things would be as we become adults and we don't live in the same state anymore. He lives in Virginia. So it kind of tests like, you know, how I have to interact with someone, make sure that they're okay when we're going through these trying times. And even though he's kind of isolated, so it makes me feel like I need to go and be even more careful and even more attentive, seeing as though he's a part from the family. And I relate with that a lot because for me, like my family we're really set on moving abroad in general. And we've always had this mindset of like, we can find a better life for ourselves in another country just because there's so many opportunities there. And so my brother is just living through that right now in Canada and just seeing him like isolated from us. Like we did have plans to go to Canada this summer just to like chill and because I'm a rising senior and everything and I need to figure out the next steps of my life. It's kind of hard on us to see that like he has to go through all of that alone in a place where he has virtually no family no friends and yeah I just it kind of feels like that for everyone but it's especially hard when like you know that even if you did want to like travel you probably couldn't because you would have to go through all that weird stuff yeah Yeah. I've honestly kind of been wondering um what it's like for people who may not have anybody else living with them and how that kind of like takes even more of a toll on their mental health and how isolated they're feeling. Okay, Heike, imagine if like you're dating someone and then because of the fact that you're in quarantine, you quarantine together, but then you break up over the course of quarantine. But and then oh it's, my god, like, there's gonna be so much tension in the house because of like you two trying to work it out. I don't know. I, I don't. I'm, I'm not particularly fond of my family. We're close with them, so I'm. I don't know how it feels like being the only people that I have to talk to all the time. But I would, you know, I'm going to do like a straight pivot here. While we're talking about the topic of isolation, what are your guys's opinions about the use of solitary confinement when it comes to prison? Because when I heard about this topic, when I started researching about it, that's the first thing I thought about, about how horrific it is to put people in solitary confinement for so long. So what do y'all think about that as a means of torture, especially in the U.S. prison system? I mean, it's no surprise to anybody how corrupt and just honestly not that effective that the, you know, the police system and prisons are in the United States. I think it's horrible, like, unless they're really, like, going to hurt someone in the prison, like, they need to be, like, isolated from the other people just so they don't hurt them or something like that, or the opposite. It shouldn't be used as a means of torture personally for me, even though I know they're a criminal or whatever they claim they are. So you don't think they deserve to be solitary confined, even though they are criminal? Well, honestly, it depends on, I'm not going to say that everybody in the prisons are criminals or anything, because, you know, America, but um, I definitely do think unless there's like a good reason for it, and depending on how long they're in solitary confinement, why they're there, all of that, there's a lot of things you have to take into factor, but it definitely is a kind of like, it's really... There's like a wide spectrum of it's really things heavy. that you can go to prison for. And so, you know, maybe it applies to some people, but maybe not for others. Well, Ray, I would ask you, do you, one, do you consider solitary confinement to be torture? And then two, do you think that criminals, even 
those who commit the most heinous of crimes deserve torture? I don't know. I think I think solitary confinement is torture. Did, did you ever watch that video of the one dude? Oh, like the Vsauce minefield video where he tried to confine himself in a white room because he was just like, oh, people go in and then they fucking go crazy. I think I think it's a form of torture. I feel like people really romanticize that image of like the insane asylum patient just stuck in a white padded room with like a straight jacket on, like laughing to themselves. I feel like people do romanticize. Think, yeah, people do romanticize sexy? it. Yeah. And <laughs> mm, I love but, that for you. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'm just thinking about like that in solitary confinement, and, like how even to now, like, that hasn't proven to have a whole ton of positive effects for people mentally. And, like, that in itself, if you really wanted to cure a lot of these patients within these asylums, within these um, prison systems, why would you want to provoke what could already be, like, an existing mental health disorder? Perhaps you don't take into account how gruesome that form of torture can be, is what I would guess. Or maybe they don't care, because if you believe that criminals should be tortured, then you have a different idea of what prison should be. Yeah, I think it goes down to what you ultimately view as the point of imprisonment and the point of solitary confinement. Sorry, I think I had a point, but I think I lost it. (laughs) Um, Kind of like what you were saying, I don't think the point of prison is to hold all the criminals in one place. The point of prison should be to reform, to change, to like let them go back out to society as a good person if you know that's what their charge is so I definitely do think that you know we shouldn't be thinking we're focused so much on punishment rather than like actually change and improvement and I don't think that's right I mean there's obviously a lot of corruption in the prison system right now it sucks it was interesting to see the jump between like home isolation and solitary confinement, but I do actually do kind of see a thread of similarity <laughs> between do you, the two things. Do you feel imprisoned in your own home? Do you feel imprisoned in your own body? <laughs> oh, well. I mean, okay, well, so there was someone who said earlier that they were like, oh, I feel like my home is a prison or something. Oh, like that person would probably feel like if you're not allowed to go out. I don't know who said it. Someone said it. Might have been Faith, since, like, she literally can't leave. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, 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 it was you. Yeah, I definitely do feel like a prisoner. And this isn't even just, like, right now. Like, this is what my summer is always like, to be honest. Oh, because there's no reason to go out, to go to school. So you can't, I guess. Just because, like, I have a lot of um, home responsibilities. So, like, I don't get to go out in general. And I live, like, 30 minutes away from my school. So there's not a lot of, like, accessibility to, like, go talk to my friends. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't drive to, like recently so yeah my town is structured in a way that allows like my friends and i are conveniently decently close so i guess if we wanted to we could go we could see each other but like we're not going to break social distancing so i've been staying at home a lot too we have experienced a whole ton of tragic things since this thing has started but for the most part it seems that people do like quarantining in and of itself doesn't really deviate from their normal life in what capacity in the sense that a lot of the people here seem to be comfortable with standing, spending extended periods of time just with themselves, and it won't, like, I almost said a bad word, but, like, it won't mess up their minds as much as, Say like, a bad word if you want. <laughs> mm. I get what you mean. I would say that it differs from person to person. Like, um, I would say, personally, if I were in um raised position, and I didn't have a sister that I consider one of my best friends, if I didn't have, you know, like, I wasn't really close to my family, I don't know how I would handle it as well. I don't think I would handle it the same as Ray. But, you know, it's different from person to person, I just say. Yeah, I'm just the type of person who is okay thriving in this kind of environment, and I'm okay with people. Like, if you're, maybe if you're an extrovert and you get a lot of energy from hanging around with physical people and a physical touch, and the fact that you don't have that makes you feel deprived also kind of like the lack of choice like yeah you can choose to kind of isolate yourself stay in your room all day but there's also that you know if you need to you can go outside but right now it kind of just feels like even if you want to you shouldn't go outside or you know some states have laws against going outside so you're like even more restricted and you don't have that choice to be honest i think personally though having the freedom of time um has given you me a lot of different means of choice to do with my time instead of studying for tests or 
travel travel time to go places i have. feel like since we've been so isolated for some time and if any of you i mean i know like the texas folk you guys haven't been able to like return to normalcy but as my town has gone back to normalcy i feel like the vestiges of being isolated for so long still find its way into our interactions for example when i went to the library today um it was so weird i went to the study section and when i went to go put a book back the librarian was standing away from me six feet obviously but it was as if i was some sort of foreign alien that she didn't know she'd come close to or else she'd be hurt and then she was like you can't put your books back on the shelf you have to put it on this cart so it could be disinfected and i was like what are you talking about same thing with when i went to the teens area and this guy like poked at my sister and he was also staying very far away and he was like you need to have your mask on and I was like I can't even I wouldn't have been able to even imagine this last year a couple months ago but now it's like even when we're allowed to be in the same space we still have to keep our own bubble in a way that we never had to before yeah I've actually been wondering that for example like for people who are going back to school like will we be parking six feet apart in the parking lot will we be standing six feet apart with our chairs be six feet apart will they be like sanitizing every five seconds like i'm just like wondering how that will also work people have been a lot more neurotic about it like my parents for instance it's better to be safe than sorry really but it's really like it gets to you when you see your parents like vacuuming the house every other hour and desanitizing everything as soon as like somebody so much as like walks by our house it's really like just seeing the measures that people have to go through in order to just survive it's takes the a lot of the like a lot of your energy out of everything and it just demotivates you kind of like so many people are doing that but it's still not enough at least i guess in my state it's still not enough and i guess there's more people just not doing that and just more people getting sick every day so yeah i can see that how that kind of just makes you feel more pessimistic in life. I heard that Harvard was going to test their students every three days for COVID. And honestly, at this point, it's like, how are we, how are we going to go back to normalcy? But how are we going to ensure social distancing? Like you said, Faith, how are we going to make sure we're always six feet apart? Are we going to be wearing masks and gloves to school? Are we going to have hand sanitizer at every corner? I feel bad for um, kids who, like, this is their first year of school, like, first graders, because this is not what anyone could prepare them for. Yeah, and I know every, like, um, I got my license this um, early this past school year, and it got to a point where almost every week I'd have to drive someone different to school just because of the nature of high schoolers and transportation, and it's like, how can you have transportation and have car? pooling just to get to school if you're trying to social distance at the same time. I feel like there's a lot of questions that we we'll have to ask ourselves and still need to be answered in terms of opening up schools in that aspect as well. Yeah, how are we going to have buses if we're trying to social distance? And that's T. Personally, our carpool too, so I definitely like that's just going to be interesting. But definitely buses, like, I didn't even think of that. That's going to be crazy working around. Oh, that's going to be so weird, people. yeah. Super weird. Do you think they're going to have, like, bus guards? Or, like, well, not, not the people guards, but, like, a, a thing. A thing between the two. Oh, that's interesting, because, like, at my school, we do have bus, because, like, with the nature of some of the kids that go to our school, we do have to have bus chaperones, like, this one, like, big guy, and this one lady that kind of just acts as an attendant, and it's, yeah, I feel like that's going to be emphasized a whole lot more, but I don't know how. Actually, I don't think so, because those are, like, extra people, right, and you don't want extra people on Yeah, the that's what it, <laughs> it's probably going to be, like, It might be, like, a weird know. schedule thing where someone has to wake up, like, extra early, and they have to do two rounds of buses or something. Dude, that's there were so many other good options instead of choose virtual or choose this or that, that, you know, people kind of just canceled out. I mean, the three options was, like, three options for my school were virtual only, and then, like, go to school only, and then, like, half and half. And I like half and half, which is what the majority of people are going to do. So that might be okay. Yeah. Like, every other every other day you go to school. Too. So, yeah. like, every other day there's someone on, on the bus. So then there's, like, going to be maybe half the people on the bus, which is the exact amount they may need. 
yeah kind of like the half and half thing my school had other options they were looking at other options like some people come in the morning some people come in the afternoon or like the every other day one that you were talking about i really like half and half i think it gives the best of both worlds because you get to see people but you don't also get to be very very stressed by like having school all the time it's like one school when it was something then all the other just like copy and paste it i know some <laughs> i know some schools want to do it where they have like only a couple grades a day like okay you'll have nine and tenth on these days and then you'll have um 11 and 12 on these days just so that you can keep the school at 50 percent capacity and that might work for some smaller schools but i go to a school that has like over 2200 people so even at half capacity that's a lot i think that's to have kind of a shit building. idea i think it's a shit idea because like if you're a ninth grader and it's your school day and you go to school and there's a classroom everyone who's in your class normally would be in your class and then you would have failed the social distancing that right would be super weird for people who yeah. are our siblings in different grades to have to go at different times or have to drop each oh, other yeah. off at different times. Yeah, wait, that's, yeah, that's like two, that's two things. Well, yeah, people yeah. have to adjust their carpooling schedules or... Uh, and also for just like students who are taking like maybe advanced classes or the opposite, how would they, they'd just be like the only students in online. their grade? Even if I do have school this fall like my parents still aren't going to be comfortable with me riding the bus so I'm probably gonna have to drive to school and um yeah just like having not having maximum capacity for sure for the student body I just wonder how that'll affect like student culture, like just morale because that's super big at my school and I know that a lot of people like chose to go to my school just because of that and so it's going to be pretty weird yeah, in terms of culture, that's also a huge thing because part of what makes going to high school and going to in-person high school what it is, at least where I live, because in Texas, football season is a huge thing. Football, marching band, all of those different things. And it'll be near impossible to do that with social distancing. But I just wonder what impact that'll have on the student body when all of a sudden the activities people have done for years and have worked on for years or the things that really bring our school together in those first months just might not happen. Our My school is really weird in that we're all fucking nerds. So, like, if we try to host a party or a dance, like, no <laughs> one signs up. It's <laughs> just devastating. Um, but how will clubs meet, for example, or if you have, like, a, a team, a competitive team, for example, like, how would they get together to practice all together? at the same day, at the same time, um, and maintain their focus in a classroom, you know? Yeah, because some people, like, really, they stake a lot of what they do on that, like, being able to gather in large crowds like that. One of my friends, she's a cheerleader, she's kind of just, like, wondering, like, that's her whole thing, it's rallying, uh, it's rallying people up, right? <laughs> and so, like, how are, how, how are you supposed to cheer? <laughs> Who would you be cheering for? It's, like, you in the middle of, like, an empty football stadium. It's so weird. <laughs> it's, it's, social, it's social distancing cheering in which everybody cheers and sends in a clip of them cheering. Then you have an editor who edits together all the clips, and then you, like, edit them. You Photoshop <laughs> them next, on, on, on the field next to the football team. On green screen. Yeah, man. Cheer every, every time they sanitize. <laughs> kind of about the topic of culture so how would you say like your own personal ethical culture is like impacted by for example isolation or your connection with nature and the earth and your mental health i gotta tell you i'm i'm really afraid that this time is going to make me kind of grow a phobia of the outside like as you guys were talking I literally had to do some breathing exercises because I know it's fun to joke about, but it's really, really freaking me out how bad this coronavirus is getting, what it's going to mean for the next school year. I I was talking to my friend today about how, what's speech and debate going to be like? What's model young going to be like? What's anything that made school fun going to be like? And I don't know what that's going to do to my priorities for next year. If I'll even want to go out once it's safe to go out anymore, because I'll be so used to staying at home. If that'll, I don't know how I'll be mentally able to handle it. If we have the option and it becomes the reality of just doing online all year, if we can't do any extracurricular, any extracurriculars, if we can't go to any sports games, I don't know how I'm going to be able to handle that, to be really frank with you. Okay, Haiki, I'm scared that I will get sensory overload once I come back. Like, if, if school goes yeah. to normal someday, and then I have to come back and see, like, a thousand kids in lunchtime, I will get sensory overload, and then I will die. <laughs> that is my fear. My school already doesn't have sports, it doesn't have fine arts or any of that. Like, it's already as basic and as, like, 
sad as a school can get but now we were going virtual and we can't even do like the little clubs that we do have so I'm just wondering like how much worse and how that will just like really impact the school year um definitely like for me I'm a section leader in band and in band one of the things that helped me so much freshman year of high school was just having my senior section leaders and having all the upperclassmen in the section just there to help adjust to being in high school. And I just feel so bad for all the freshmen who are coming in who won't have that support system anymore. Yeah, sectionals in my orchestra are completely student led by the section leaders. So if it's online, kind of awkward and also like you can't play together. And also like our room is not big enough to accommodate social distancing plus an entire orchestra. And I don't know. Shut up about the band geeks comment. I'm not. (laughs) Every band geek doesn't want to be a band geek. I used to do choir, and I'm just looking at some of like my underclassmen and how they've been dealing with that. Like they've been doing choir on Zoom, and some of them have had to Zoom. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so they've had to Zoom from like all certain parts of the world because I go to an international school, so like every single year your class looks completely different and more often than not your friend is not going to be there next year and so like just seeing like quarantine just makes it so much more complicated because you're like oh this teacher was supposed to leave that student was supposed to leave but you're still technically the taking the same classes with them they just don't happen to be in the same country and yeah it's just it's just really weird to see how like people can still get together but like it's just like knowing that you probably won't be able to see them again really after that. It's just kind of messes you up, you know? Yeah, definitely. Okay, we were going to have um, our concerto competition winner play with the orchestra for the Pops concert, but now that... Oh, wait, it's such a... This is such a third world... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Such a first world problem. But, like, now now that he has to go next year and he probably won't be coming back next year, we can't... We couldn't do it with him, and it was kind of sad. All right, so let's wrap up this episode by kind of just ending with how your personal, ethnical, racial, whatever culture connects with, you know, mental health and also environmental health. Mm, I think I have a pretty interesting relationship with it because I do consider myself pretty void of culture. I don't really identify with my home culture. I don't identify with a lot of the countries I've lived in because I usually jump in between countries. So I don't really have a solid sense of home. And so just like the fact that I've been isolated in this place for so long, it's very foreign to me and I don't really know what to make of it. Well, I want to say, I'm pretty sure July is Minority Mental Health, right? Yes. Yeah, Minority Mental Health Month. Um, I would say that all those things that you mentioned, race, environment, I, I would say it's impacted. Um, I would say that, you know, when we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, it's really affected the mental health of Blacks across America. And when we talk about environment, because, you know, there's such thing as environmental racism, I would say that growing up in an area that is predominantly black i and now that i've moved away from it i can see it from a distance it's really saddening because you know the town that people i grew up with people that i still talk to the family i have they are statistically more likely to get coronavirus or live in neighborhoods that have coronavirus and that's currently the case most of my friends when i tell them you know libraries are opening up they they're like what are you talking about how could that be happening? And I don't know. It's just, I think that it's definitely changed the culture. It's made us more politically aware because we see what it's like when you have a commander in chief that doesn't know what they're doing. And it's definitely going to, I think we're going to be a generation, at least the black youth is going to be one that takes more charge like that we already have a history of doing when it comes to any problem that we face, whether it's mental health, whether it's the downsides of living in the neighborhoods that we do, whether it's an entire national pandemic, global, really. I think it's going to change the culture for the better. There's an uptick of xenophobia because uh, the coronavirus originated in China. So there's a lot of people going, if you're Asian American or you look remotely Asian, then you must have the coronavirus, which kind of sucks. But at the same time, I think it gives a lot of people an idea of what it means to be oppressed in society. Before I kind of talk about that, shout out to our webinar. (laughs) 
which is actually going to be about minority mental health month oh sexy july. yeah so shout out to our webinar it's on july 25 and 26 i think yeah i will that is yep. very scrumptious mm, yeah yes. <laughs> i like how you did talk about kind of how it's also impacting like you know um asian american culture and how you know they're being perceived right now because of this crisis and pandemic so yeah I personally have had a lot of um, Asian American friends just talk to me about how they've been going through a really hard time because, for example, like one of my friends personally, like she'll just like go to like Walmart or Target and people have like just like started yelling at her in the middle of the store for like no reason, like judging her and like giving them strange looks in the store. Any last comments on just like culture and race in relation to environmental health? If you're ever feeling down and you feel like your house is a prison, put on a mask, maybe even some gloves, and take a walk around your neighborhood just to get some fresh air so that you won't go completely insane. I've actually found walks to be incredibly helpful for just keeping sane in this entire time. I actually go outside more just in terms of taking walks than I did in summer breaks past and any breaks past. And that's helped so much in these later months of quarantine, just trying to keep my mental space. So 10 out of 10 recommend. Definitely. And I feel like this entire pandemic has shifted our definition of like what home feels like and what a home actually is. So if any of you are just feeling down, make sure just there's so many resources available online. Chances are you're listening to this online. So yeah, just don't be afraid to reach out. Feel free to reach out to one of us. We're always open and yeah. Um, yeah, text the Instagram and like ask to join the Discord for Motive so you can vent on our channel. Yep.